Great. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, and uh, thanks for attending today's webinar on biodiversity net gain. Um, I'm just wondering, Barbara, very quickly, is there a way to make sure that everyone can hear me okay? Or should I just carry on? If anybody can't hear, has any problems, in, um, just pop it in the chat and I will yeah. be Perfect. Cool. So, yeah, um, thank you everyone for joining today's uh, webinar. So, here at the North Wales and the Northwest branch, um, I think it's fair to say that we've felt the effects of COVID. Um, so we've not had a chance to host as many events as we normally would have liked due to various reasons. Um, uh, for example, you know, many of us have commitments, uh, look at, you know, home, homeschooling and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I don't need to give you the full lowdown. I'm pretty sure you're all aware. But um, yeah, we've had these challenges that we've had to face. But now I think with the COVID restrictions lifting, um, and now that I think everyone's settled in a work routine, um, uh, you know, mixed work routine, whether it's from home or the office, I think we're hoping to increase the number of events going forward um, and the webinars that we're holding. So, yeah, thanks again for joining. Uh, and hopefully there'll be much more to come uh, from this branch. So today's seminar is part of the uh, part of SIWAM's Biodiversity Digital Series. Um, and this brings together a number of SIWAM events in the lead up to COP15, which is taking place in October. Um, but I think that's just uh, uh, that's just a starting to, event. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Emma, but could you just go through the housekeeping points first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Next um, slide. Yeah. So, um, I'll qu yeah, just going quickly through the housekeeping. Um, so this webinar event will be recorded. Um, we'll only put recordings of our events up on the Cyber website and possibly on YouTube. Um, uh, as well. I think the speakers just need to confirm permission and then um, it'll be onto the website. But if you want to view any past digital series as well, it's um, uh, you can, there's that link there. I think Barbara can pop into the chat and and, we, uh, and you can watch uh, past videos there. Um, if you experience any technical issues uh, and need assistance, please use the chat feature on, the, on Zoom uh, to let us know what the problem is. And um, uh, we can take a look at that for you. Um, and while we'll try to take most of your questions at the end of the presentation, if, you, if you'd like to put a question or make a comment about the talk, then please use the Q&A facility um, on Zoom. Uh, so chat should be, the chat facility should be for technical issues only. Uh, and then we've got a separate Q&A faci uh, facility. And when asking your question, please state who you, you are posing the question to. Um, uh, the last point is that there's uh, one hour CPT attributable to this webinar, uh, but we don't provide CPD certificates. So I hope that is okay. Um, uh, just jumping back to uh, the SIWAM Biodiversity Digital Series. So that's uh, a series which brings together a number of SIWAM events uh, uh, in the lead up to COP15. And I think it's just a holding event um, uh, a virtual event taking place in October with these subsequent events taking uh, place uh, 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 next year in 2022. So I think, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, the, there's been a lot of good series so far. Um, there's more events coming up. So um, uh, just to let you know, I think on the 26th, I think it is, it's World River Day uh, 2021. So that takes place on the fourth Sunday in September every year. Um, and it's essentially a celebration of the world's waterways. So it highlights the many values of our rivers, um, strives to increase public awareness and encourages uh, the improved stewardship of all rivers around the world. And rivers in virtually every country face an array of threats at the moment. And only through our active involvement can we ensure their health in the years uh, ahead. Um, we've got uh, a, a number of uh, uh, additional upcoming events as well. So um, I think Barbara will send a link uh, to those upcoming events in the chat as well, um, uh, which yeah, feel free to have a look at and um, uh, uh, and attend. So um, yeah, it's also worth making uh, making you aware that this series also stems from Siwam's pledge to mobilize its members to become climate champions uh, after the trustees of Siwam in 2019 declared uh, a climate and ecological 
um, uh, emergency. So it's, I think that's a good thing to be aware of. Um, but yeah, given that this event has been aimed at all members, including students, we won't be delving into too much uh, technical depth. So I think it's pitched at uh, uh, you know a wide audience. So I hope you enjoy this. Uh, you know, uh, good luck at biodiversity net gain. Um, but I do want to say I do welcome any professionals that are attending this webinar and their opinions to share their experiences. Um, you know, at the end of the presentation and views about biodiversity net gain, its application at the end of the presentation. Um, you know, I'll be I'll be very keen to hear as I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm just learning about the topic as is everyone else. So. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to that. Um, just jumping onto the agenda now. So um, we'll start off with introductions uh, very briefly. Then I'll give a background um, on uh, uh, biodiversity net gain. Um, uh, Anna Kilty, who's one of the speakers, she'll be uh, discussing the legislation and giving an overview of the biodiversity metric 3.0. So the 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 DEFRA biodiversity metric tool. Um, and then Anna will also give us a brief, um, her, her, briefly her thoughts on challenges and benefits of its application. Then I'll hand over to uh, Fran Moore, who will um, discuss uh, a case study, which is natural capital in the Trent, uh, in the Trent Valley. Um, but it did include, um, uh, you know, use of the biodiversity metrics tool. So it does, it did incorporate some form of um, uh bng so um uh yeah and then after that we'll move on to discussion questions and answers if, if that's okay um so just moving on to uh introduction so uh my name is amar ahmed i'm the northwest and north wales honorary secretary uh, i'm a senior pm at binnies so we were the uk and water environment team in back and reach but we're now part of the rsk group i have worked in the field of flood risk management with clients such as Natural Resources Wales and the EA. And although BNG is something that's not a core part of my day-to-day -day duty, so just caveating here, I'm not a, by any means an expert. Um, it's, it's something that's, uh, it's a very important aspect of developments going forward. Uh, and it's something we all really uh, ought to get to, let, you know, become familiar with. So like many attendees on this call, I'm just keen to learn more as well and hence have brought some experts along with me. Um, so yeah, to any students, I would certainly recommend you know reading into this topic a bit more, whether you're a civil engineer, an aspiring civil engineer, environmental scientist, uh, you know planner, just just think it's a good idea to 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 read a bit more about it. So, if I could hand over to Anna to introduce herself. Thank you. Um, I'm Anna Kilty. I'm a principal consultant at APEM Limited, um, specialising in natural capital and biodiversity net gain. Um, previously, I worked for the Environment Agency uh, in typical EA fashion. I had uh, a plethora of roles, um, but latterly in my career, I worked on security of supply and developed the natural capital guidance uh, for the water resource uh, planning guideline. And over to Fran. Hi, I'm going to put my video on and say hello to everyone. Um, so I'm Principal Natural Capital Specialist and Environmental Economist here at Binnies, formerly Black and Beach. I've been here about eight years now. Um, yeah, basically just working on natural capital assessments, both on an infrastructure sort of project by project basis and then um, across sort of strategic landscape nature recovery programmes as well. I'll leave it there. Back to the hammer. Yeah, great. Thanks, Fran. Uh, and thanks, Anna. So just jumping on to the background. So I'll quickly give you a run through the background and then I'll hand over to Anna. So um, do, do, do. what is biodiversity? So I think it's important just to make sure that, you know, for those that are not familiar with the topic, it's, uh, it's good to understand definitions to begin with. So according to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, it is the variability among living organisms from all sources, including inter alia, terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems and ecological complexes of which they are part. This includes diversity within species, between species and of ecosystems. So put simply, biodiversity refers to the variety of life on earth. So what's the problem that underpins the need for biodiversity net gain? So human activity is a main cause of declining biodiversity, largely to meet growing demands for food, shelter, uh, fuel, water, and the ever-growing requirements of consumerism. 
So in the year 2000, Kofi Annan, who is the, then the United Nations Secretary General, called for a global assessment of ecosystem services. And this is on the back of many years of advancements in environmental policy development. And in 2005, the first global assessment of biodiversity, um, which is called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, that reported, and there were some staggering facts, um, you know, over the past 50 years, humans have changed ecosystems more than in any other comparable period of time. Uh, there's been an unprecedented decline in nature, accelerating rates of species extinction, um, and 25% of species assessed in animal and plant groups were classified as, as threatened. So, yeah, there's um, quite alarming uh, facts coming out of that, uh, that study. And in 2019, the next global assessment of biodiversity by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform uh, on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services um, reported 14 of the 18 categories of contributions from nature had declined since the 1970s. So contributions, for example, include food, climate regulation, uh, and air quality. It also reported that human actions have already driven uh, at least 680 vertebrate species to extinction since 1500. So like I said, these reports are clearly um, uh, sharing some, some staggering facts. Um, the global report of biodiversity is mirrored in the UK. So the 2019 State of Nature report stated that 15% of species in the UK uh, are threatened with extinction. Um, since 1970, the abundance of UK priority species has declined by 60%, and there's been a general decline of species abundance of 13% uh, on average. So, I, I mean, I could share many additional facts with you, but I think I think two things. Um, apologies, one that I'm probably teaching you to suck eggs because there's a lot of good documentaries out there at the moment which uh, which are sharing this uh, um, uh, say, uh, you know similar types of information. But clearly, there's uh, the, there's um, there's a big problem that really needs to be addressed and um, you know global efforts are being made to address these issues. So now you know what the problem is, what's been done to try to solve the problem. Uh, on a global scale, the parties of the countries under the Convention of Biological Diversity, which includes the UK, meet at regular COP events. So the Convention of Biological Diversity, it's a multi, uh, multilateral treaty uh, and during uh, COP10 in 2010, which is in Aichi in Japan, uh, 20 targets for biodiversity were set. Now, I won't read all the targets, but there were just to give you a flavor of what the targets were. Um, target 12, for example, um, it said by 2020, the extinction of known threatened species has been prevented, and their conservation status, particularly of those most in decline, has been improved and sustained. Or the other one that's on the screen, target seven, by 2020, areas under agriculture, aquaculture, and forestry are managed sustainably. So you could see they're quite definitive targets, although the the time the time frame was, you know, arguably relatively short. Um, these were the targets that were set uh, in Aichi, and I definitely recommend giving them a read. Um, but in 2019, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, on behalf of DEFRA, they submitted the sixth report to uh, the CBD. Um, on the UK's progress in meeting these uh, targets. And it stated that the UK failed to meet uh, 14 of the 19 targets assessed. Um, it assessed uh, uh, five of the targets uh, as on track to achieve, one of which included integration of biodiversity into, planning, into the planning process and national accounting. Now, by looking at the targets, you can see where the background of integration of biodiversity has come from and the concept of again and how difficult it's actually been to reach these targets, perhaps because of the time frame or because of the scale of the works involved. But this re really further reinforces the problems uh, surrounding uh, you know, biodiversity today. But that's not to say that you know, there hasn't been any work done to date. There's been, uh, there's been a lot of uh, work done in, uh, in the last decade, and it has been on the UK's radar um, you know, for, for a while now. Um, and the, you know, the United Kingdom, in the United Kingdom, we have been developing uh, in this field. So in 2010, Professor Son, Sir John Lawton and his panel of experts, they released the Make Space for, for Nature report, which concluded that uh, isolated nature reserves uh, are not enough to cope with climate change uh, and additional pressures from the nation. So the report stated 
to reverse the effects of degradation to date, you know, action is required at a whole landscape level. So almost like a holistic level, interconnecting sites of high quality um, uh, uh, ecology. So the report laid out principles to move forward and 24 recommendations were made uh, of which have, uh, we have been moving forward with. So this report really drove change and brought together the work that had been done up to this point on a national and international level and called on policymakers uh, to take the recommendations forward within the UK. Um, you know, further, you know, further after that, a net gain objective was a place uh, was placed in the national planning policy framework in 2012, uh, when it replaced the previous policy objective of no net loss. And then further work was was done subsequent to that. So um, a metric was originally developed as part of uh, a DEFRA 2012 to DEFRA for, uh, uh, 2014 biodiversity offsetting pilot program. Uh, to achieve net gain. So the aim of this exercise was for developers to literally offset biodiversity loss because of development. So they could either uh, provide the offset themselves or use an offset provider. Uh, and the pilot took place in six local authorities across England and Wales. However, only one offset site was agreed in two years and no offset sites were created in that time. Um, uh, although there were uh, 16 potential section 106 agreements in the pipeline. So there was unanimous agreement um, within the pilot groups that the current planning application process failed to, to achieve no net loss or uh, net gain. So this is you know, an additional stimulant for change. Um, in 2016, the industry also published some good practice principles for biodiversity net gain in order to achieve government commitments, um, because at the time there were no re real standards in place for achieving net gain. So as you could see, you know, this is something that's been cropping up in, in policy, it's uh, in governmental department documents and studies, and clearly there has been a lot of work um, within the last decade to move in the right direction. But there's still clearly you know, more to do in order to, uh, to meet the IG targets. Um, just to you know, give a further update for those that are unaware, but um, you know, the, the United Nations uh, General Assembly has declared that from 2021 to 2030, um, that this will be the, the, the decade on ecosystem restoration. So the aim is that during this decade on ecosystem restoration, it'll help countries race against the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, and then the UN uh, environment, so that's the authority that set, you know, sets out the global environment agenda uh, and the food and agriculture organization, they will lead the implementation of the decade uh, with partners. So the hope is that this will draw together um, political support, scientific research, and financial muscle to scale up restoration. Um, and of course, we've got the upcoming COP events to look forward to as well. Um, so I hope this gives you a good background on, on uh, to, you know, how, how we've gotten to where we are today. Uh, and I'll hand over to, to Anna to talk about the, the legislation um, uh, surrounding biodiversity net gain. Let me just share my screen. Great, thanks. I hope everyone can see that. So uh, as we've heard um, just now, there's been a huge amount of kind of work done over the last 15, well, 10 to 15 years. Um, but it's biodiversity net gain has really started to launch, um, I suppose, into consultants and regulators uh, mindset, mostly from the 25 year environment plan, which feels like a lifetime ago, but I think it was only 2018 from memory. So we're really starting to see um, from there, we've got the subsequent environment bill. We're also seeing um, a real launch of the natural capital approach, um, and that's trickling down into various aspects of regulator policy. Um, and we're also seeing um, a huge amount of scrutiny on natural capital and subsequent biodiversity net gain coming through from that, um, particularly within local authorities. So at the moment, from what you understand with biodiversity net gain, it's going to be owned by local authorities and they will effectively be the gatekeepers of the process. So developers will have to do this um, and there will be a mandated use of the biodiversity metric 3.0 tool, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, as I discussed earlier, I, I wrote the Water Resource Planning Guideline, uh, Supplementary Guidance for uh, Environment and Society and Decision Making, which covers natural capital and biodiversity net gain. And water companies will have to consider natural capital and biodiversity net gain within their water resource management plans and likely their drainage uh, and wastewater plans, which is coming. 
So those represent fairly hefty um, investments. We're talking about millions of pounds of infrastructure schemes um, that will be required to meet these. So we're looking at some actual real uh, tangible gain for the environment, which is really exciting. Oh, my slides have stopped working. So the timeline for this is that, so it was announced in 2019, uh, Biodiversity Net Gain in the Environment Bill. There was a previous consultation in December 2018, and it will amend the Town and Country Planning Act eventually, and it's likely to become law in 2023. So it feels like quite a way off, but actually it's not. So the key components of uh, mandatory biodiversity net gain is that it's going to be a 10% and we'll need to use the biodiversity metric tool. One of the key things for this is that it will be secured for at least 30 years and that will have to be done through either obligations or um, agreements set out similar to what regulators such as the Environment Agency or Natural England use currently and it has the opportunity to be on-site, off-site or via statutory biodiversity credits. That doesn't mean to say that the mitigation hierarchy is uh, null and void, it still applies. And there's also our exceptions. So some of the, I think HS2 is actually ex exempt. So there are gonna be some exemptions, but by and large, most things will be covered. So timelines we're seeing, so the environment bill through parliament is gonna be a key factor for all of the timelines that you can see on the screen. So depending on when that goes through and given that uh, the world is quite a busy place at the moment and parliament's quite busy by the sounds of it, with COVID and Brexit and everything else, um, we have seen delays in the environment bill going through. So it's currently predicted that autumn 2021, the environment bill will gain royal assent and then there'll be a consultation on the instruments and regulations. We're then likely to see the government response to consultation in spring 2022. And then the BNG site register and statutory credit sales platform is likely to go live in spring 2023. Within autumn 2023, the biodiversity net gain will become mandatory for all town and country planning developments. But we're likely to see a big plethora of work between spring 2022 and 2023. Um, so we don't know what that site register and statutory credit sales platform will look like yet or how to access that. So I imagine most of you or so a few of you on the call have actually seen the biodiversity metric tool 3.0. So it's effectively a very fancy spreadsheet. And what it does is it assesses the biodiversity unit value of an area of land. So it's about consistency. It's not a replacement for local expert judgment, but it's an effective way of consistently measuring biodiversity and it uses habitat as a proxy for biodiversity. So it measures and accounts for the direct impacts. So often working on habitat loss as well as taking into account condition changes. And it compares proposal for a site such as creating enhancing habitat on site or off site, as well as looking at changes in conditions and changes in use. So here's another example of what the actual spreadsheet looks like when you get into it. So you can use it with desktop survey data, but it does re it's designed really to be used with walkover data. And effectively what you do is you insert all your different polygons um, of the different habitat types, how much, um, how big they were, and things like their condition score and their strategic significance. So anything that's kind of grayed out in that beige color, is automatically populated by the tool um, and you would input into the white areas. So some of the challenges of working with the biodiversity metric tool is that not all habitat is valued. So things like ancient woodland, you need to use a separate tool for ancient woodland because that shouldn't be touched at all. It's also as well best with walkover data, but that's not what we're seeing so far in practice. So we're seeing lots of tenders coming through at the moment with local authorities wanting to understand the baseline for their biodiversity um, units that they hold within their patches. So it's not feasible to do a walkover assessment for every single or for an entire county, for example, an entire local authority area. So it's understanding about how you can get a decently detailed baseline, but also understand whether or not that um, whether or not that makes you sure that's compatible with the biodiversity metric tool. Cross-border issues as well, apologies uh, anyone here from Wales, this doesn't apply to Wales or Scotland at the moment, this is literally a piece of, um, this is a tool for England. Wales and Scotland are likely to have their own 
uh, metrics or their own approaches to this. I know Nature Scott are looking at a non-metric based approach. And Wales, I believe it will come under the Wellbeing Act. So those are still in process. But what that looks like for cross-border catchments, for example, so particularly for water companies working, how are you going to understand this? And are we going to lose out on, uh, can we do offsetting or offsite work in different countries? So Wales or Scotland, and that still be accountable and how will that fit with those uh, devolved nations legislation? And then we've got local expert knowledge is always going to trump what you see. So for example, uh, some scrubland isn't valued very highly, but that's not to say it's not a useful resource. So in some areas we know that scrubland is home to locally or nationally significant populations of night jars or certain inverts and the tool doesn't value that properly in some respects and there are other examples of that so there is a big chunk in the tools guidance about how you can override that but are we going to see that in practice is the question and it's making sure that we don't end up with a tool that just says computer says no and we don't have the resources at a local authority level to uh, intelligently interrogate that due to the loss of uh, chartered ecologists, et cetera, within the local authority regions. So it's understanding, um, making sure we don't lose the resolution, the resolution of this, and also recognizing that the biodiversity metric tool is literally a tool in the mosaic of opportunities we have when it comes to biodiversity and measuring that. There's also as well a danger which struck me earlier today, which is why it's not on these slides, but it's the case of timeliness of when people begin to do interventions. So for biodiversity net gain, it must always increase in value. Now, the question is, is that is that going to mean that savvy landowners that are looking at this in the future are going to delay any kind of restoration works they're going to do? Because if they do it now before it's within a BNG scheme, it then it doesn't have any value from a BNG point of view because you can't retrospectively claim for it. So that's another question we need to be aware of when we're thinking about biodiversity net gain. Now, hopefully, I think, Barbara, you're going to pop all these links uh, within the chat notes, but here is a huge list of resources. Um, these are all hyperlinked, so you can have a good rummage through, but there's loads and loads of information available on the biodiversity metric and uh, the introductions. So, for example, there's Natural England on a really good YouTube video that's worth having a look at. There's lots of blogs and um, there's conference summaries and there's lots of um, those are the principles for development. So there's lots out there for everyone to have a rummage on. Um, and that's everything for me. So over to over to Fran. Wow, that was express delivery, Anna. Thank you very much. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> um, right. I, can you stop sharing and then I'll share my screen? Thank you. Um, excuse me a minute, a bit slower at this, at this time of the day. Right, I'll assume everyone can see that. If not, please shout. Um, yeah, so thanks, Anna, and hello, everyone. So as I said earlier, I'm Principal Environmental Economist and Natural Capital Lead here at Binney's. Um, today I'm going to run through an example where we have used data from the BNG metric natural capital mapping. So a bit different to the usual application of the metric for an infrastructure scheme per se, um, you know, to identify biodiversity offsetting needs, etc. Uh, we do, well, colleagues of mine do apply it regularly for infrastructure schemes, um, including mostly probably flood risk management schemes for the Environment Agency. Um, but today I just wanted to give you something a little bit different um, because personally I think it's really important that the use of the BNG tool sits within a broader natural capital approach um, and I thought this would provide an interesting example of that. Um, so this example is more about using the tool data, um, the average sort of unit that can be achieved per hectare per habitat type to look at where and how we can do more to restore biodiversity and to meet those targets that Amar was talking about and also to understand the value of these opportunities in BNG terms. So specifically as a way of attracting investment to nature recovery from a broader landscape perspective. Um, so some of the issues thrown up by the metric for me highlight the necessity um, to look at, well, as I've said already, to look at BNG metric as part of the broader suite of tools uh, set within the sort of broader natural capital nature recovery approach. 
because otherwise I think we run the risk of downplaying the importance of some habitats above others, um, but that's, that's just my view. So before I dive into this example, natural cap capital mapping, what is it? So it's about understanding the different the difference in the benefits that we derive from different habitats and land uses around us. And it's about looking at how these benefits change if we create or restore habitats. It's a way of looking across the landscape to help us understand where we need to do more to help recover nature and to also uplift the value of habitats in terms of what they provide to us. So it's not a case of valuing nature per se. We all know that that is priceless but it's about valuing the benefits that we get from nature. So nature's contribution to cleaning the air, cleaning water, helping to lock away harmful pollutants like carbon, and thus helping us to avoid future costs to us now and in the future. And if we don't, and if we ignore these values in investment and business cases, and in our day-to-day -day choices, this leads to their steady erosion and loss as we are experiencing now. So luckily things are starting to change with corporate and public sector natural capital reporting and ONS capital reporting, et cetera, and um, all the aspects which Emma touched on earlier. Um, so anyway, for this project, um, I will go on to it shortly, I promise. Um, for this project, we mapped uh, the habitats and land cover um, or natural capital for the transforming the Trent Valley study area in an online interactive story map. Uh, the link should be shared with you now on chat so that after the call, you can go away and have a play with it and, and see what you think. Um, the, the sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. are we still supposed to be on the first slide? Yes, sorry, bit of a long yeah. way bear with. <laughs> um, this is, so this project was commissioned in part to help Staffordshire Wildlife Trust towards its goal of at least 30% um, of their land to be connected and protected for nature's recovery by 2030. Um, so thus it's important to find opportunities to restore nature and we need to understand what we have and where. So I won't share the actual interactive version now due to broadband streaming limits here on Anglesey. Um, and it works better when viewed through a full monitor as well. So rather than, it does work on a laptop, but I would say it's better through a full monitor um, if you get a chance to look at it after the call. So let's crack on. So here you can see the tabs along the top there. Um, you're able to explore natural capital in terms of the stock, what's there, what's existing, uh, the flows, that's the annual um, flow of benefits that we get each year. Um, the value that we can assign to it, we can't value everything of course, but we can try our best to value what we can. Um, then we have a tab for the existing projects of the Wildlife Trust that we've valued and then a tab for broader opportunities where people can search for opportunities in terms of BNG and carbon offsetting specifically. So on this stock tab, uh, you can explore the area's habitats or the natural capital stock as it's known. Um, these are mapped to 10 meter resolution using satellite mapping. And they can be mapped based on the new UK HABS classification if required, which is better for BNG purposes. Um, the remote sensing can also be used in part to assess the condition criteria required for BNG, but not all. And it could then be a means to, it, if you use remote sensing, basically it allows you to cover a large area, which you can then ground truth in a targeted manner with boots on the ground. Um, when you look at the story map, you'll be able to click on and off different layers. Um, so if you're more interested in one over another, you can click on a polygon and it brings up the information as shown in the table there. Um, so it gives uh, an idea of the different benefits we get from that habitat type, so quantities per hectare and the values per hectare that you could perhaps expect to um, achieve. It's very indicative um, due to firstly lack of consistent similar data sources for different habitats across the board um, and also secondly it's very dependent on the habitat condition and management practices, of course. So for example, carbon across farm, farmland will vary very much based on the agricultural practices. Um, I feel a lot more work is needed so that we can all use meaningful indicators across different habitats, across different um, benefits. Um, and we really need to take care that we're not comparing apples and pears when we're talking about annu annual values versus marginal values versus um, stock values. Um, I should also say that 
compared to off the off the shelf products for habitat mapping tend to be around 20 meter resolution so um it's worth exploring uh other options to get more, more accurate data because that will really make your BN bng assessment far more accurate too um so moving on to the flow tab you can then go on to this and have a play around um so this shows benefits how they vary across the landscape by habitats and land cover types. So this is what we refer to as the flow of benefits. Again, it's to 10 meter resolution. You can zoom in and out. Um, here I'm showing carbon sequestration. So that's the difference between the amount of carbon absorbed by different habitats and land uses and how that varies each year. Again, it's indicative as it depends on many other variables such as habitat maturity, soil type, soil type, location, the density of planting, the mix of species, etc. And carbon could be shown in different ways. It could be shown as the stock value, so what's locked in. It can be shown as the annual sequestration rate. It could be shown as an average across the lifetime of that habitat. And it could be shown as an um, well, net of um, all other greenhouse gas emissions as well. So it's a work in progress for all of us where we're, we're exploring this data and finding the best way for us all to present it in a seamless manner together really. Um, here I'm showing annual data which is more read, readily available um, but it's, it's important to give a range per hectare just to, just to capture those uncertainties that I've spoken about. But it's basically just a way to allow us to start to visualise um, across the landscape how benefits change and to be able to look out across the landscape and to appreciate it in terms of what it gives to you, um, where it may be struggling and what we can do to help restore it. And there are other layers in there as well, which you can click on and off, including physical health, air quality, food production, water regulation, etc. Just wanted to show you the biodiversity one. So this one we've used um, biodiversity units per hectare as a proxy for the, the flow of uh, biodiversity from each habitat type. Um, so here it represents the flow of biodiversity services um, from each habitat type, and it's using data from the metric to give a range for each habitat. Um, again, the uh, variables, sorry, the values per hectare will vary um, based on the variables that Anna outlined, so condition and significance of the habitat, etc. And it also depends on variables perhaps less covered by the metric, so species type again and mix, and the location, the age, maturity of the habitat, density of planting, soil type, etc. Um, so each habitat type is shown by the number of biodiversity units provided by each habitat type based on DEFRA's metric 2.0, haven't updated it yet, sorry. Um, and within that wetlands and semi-natural grasslands are the highest scoring for biodiversity using the metric. So I've provided a generalised range for each habitat type. Um, in practice it involves more detail. But again, it gives a start to help us to visualise how habitats change in BNG terms across the landscape and where there might be more potential to attract funding. Um, and interesting, if you flick between the carbon and BNG layers, it, it highlights some of the shortcomings in the metric, i.e. Uh, that woodlands, due to their age and mature, ageing and maturity, timescales score lower in BNG, um, but they, of course, score higher in carbon. So that flags um, one of the risks and trade-offs we need to look at when we're planning nature recovery across the landscape and the importance of looking at the BNG tool in the context of the wider natural capital approach as well. Um, so this tab is about just showing the value of the different land cover types and habitat types. And of course it's a partial value, uh, but it's better than no value at all. Um, it maps the estimated values of habitat types across the landscape in terms of firstly their annual benefits and uh, B it's only partial as I've just said because um, it's not possible to value habitats in totality but it's a start and it's clearly showing woodland and wetland is very high and farmland is low um, but it doesn't yet I think it would be very powerful if this could start to pick up on the nuances between farming practices, so intensive versus regenerative farming, for example, and the impact that has on the, the flow of benefits uh, from catchments. And something I would argue data is much needed for, as it's the predominant, you know, farmland, I think it's at 70%, something like that, it covers across the UK. So it's something we really need to get to grips with, I think, in terms of um, natural capital. 
Um, and this slide where, is where you can pick up um, some of the projects that the Wildlife Trust are working on within um, the Transforming the Trent Valley project. Um, so we valued their projects in terms of their benefits in, in natural capital terms. And you can click on different bits and explore that. Um, um, so, uh, will provide numerous benefits to us, including cleaning our water, holding back water, storing carbon, etc. So, for this project over the Hello, Fran, I think we've lost you. I'm afraid, I think, apologies, everyone. I think we've lost Fran. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. and then... Fine, can you hear us by any chance? I can now. Something oh. happen. Have you yeah. tried putting back your screen and then we can Yeah, do you want to have a have a try sharing screen again and Yeah, did you lose me? Yeah. You're beginning to break up. You could see the screen, but we couldn't hear you properly. Okay, apologies for that. That's all right, it's just the it's just the connection connection, I think. Yeah. Sorry, that's when you live in remote places. Well, it's not that remote angle, so you shouldn't say that. <laughs> no, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, shall I just carry on from where I left off and hope for the best? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So lastly, it was just uh, describing the tab showing opportunities. So, yeah, again, what you can do, you can just map the opportunities that you've identified here you can click on an opportunity area and it gives the carbon sequestration potential and the BNG potential as per the DEFRA metric. Uh, and primarily, as I said earlier, as a means to try and attract um, funding and investment to those opportunities. Um, there are numerous nature recovery opportunities in the Transforming the Trent Valley area. These include woodland, hedgerow, grassland creation, restoration of species rich ponds, water meadows and riparian habitats. And um, of the opportunity areas, if just 10% of those opportunities were restored, they could together sequester in the region of 10 to 12,000 tonnes of carbon over 50 years. And that would represent in the region of 500 to 1,000 uh, BNG units as per the metric. So at the moment, these opportunities are aspirational and they're conservative estimates. And further work is needed with the landowners and invested as required. However, it just shows that if just 10% is restored, um, that would uplift uh, the natural capital value of the area by 200 to 300,000 pounds per year. Um, and yeah, so I'll probably just leave it there. So I just want to give an example of other ways we can use the BNG information and data to try and push forward uh, nature recovery opportunities going forward. So many thanks for your time. I apologise if I rushed that a bit, so I'm a bit worried about time. And I'll hand over for Q&A. Don't worry, fine. That was great. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to Anna as well. Um, very much appreciated. So now we'll move on to discussion um, and then uh, questions and answers as well. So um, Fran, are you are you OK to stay on the line for any chance just to yeah, answer sure. some questions? Um, so I'm still sharing. Sorry, um, we actually can't so, see the screen, um, so oh. it's okay. Yeah, okay, okay. I think, I think those that want to have a look at the tool that Fran was sharing, the link is within the chat. So Barbara has shared that. So I just recommend you know, uh, feel free to, to click on the link and have a look. Um, so just moving on to the questions now, um. We've got five questions in so far. I have seen I've seen some questions There's going. Oh, sorry, my Siri's talking to me. Um, so I was just going to say uh, I have seen some questions in the chat section. Um, so if you could put them into the Q and A facility, then then that would be great. 
Um, so the first question we've got is, um, it says the slides referred to rapid schemes. Uh, what is a rapid scheme? So I think this was on, uh, this might have been on Anna's slide. Yeah, it's not on mine, I don't think. Yeah, so I think um, what I might do is I'll ask Anna to answer that one, uh, if that's okay. Um, and we can, well, well, uh, we can, uh, Barbara, what's the best way to respond to the answer um, if it's off uh, the call? We'll produce um, a report on all the questions and yeah. I can send those to Anna and then she can um, respond to them. Great. Okay. That sounds good. Um, we had another question from, uh, uh, from someone saying, how will the LPAs check submissions? If many don't have ecologists, will they accept submissions without checking the facts and no walkovers? So that's the first one. I don't know, Fran, if you've got any thoughts on that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to pass. I'm sorry, I'm not a BNG. Um, I, I'm not an expert in the sense of using the tool on, on that basis. So, yeah. A question yeah. for Anna. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, same here. I'm not sure how much development's actually taken place on that side of things, but yeah, I think possibly that's something that's going to develop over time. Um, yeah, could be something similar to SUDS, how they had to bring SUDS approval bodies, etc. I'm I'm by no means an expert, so yeah, like you said, it's definitely one for Anna. Um, the next question was, what are the endangered species in the UK? Um, and I could see. Um, we, we've had uh, someone kindly put um, uh, a link to that, um, uh, to conservation designations, including uh, those that are endangered. Um, they passed a link for that. So I'll assume that that's uh, that question sorted. Um, um, what I would say is some of the endangered yeah. species are, you know, if you, if you look at hedgehogs and also dormice and um, the other one I'm thinking of my brain's going um they you know they wild wild cat is probably the most endangered um animal that we have on the in the UK um there are all sorts of programs that are being used to actually try and resuscitate them and introduction of, of the ex extinct species like um beavers for example that have, that have gone on but yeah. um it's yeah, the water vole, that's a water vole. Yeah, 90% drop in its population. Um, so it's, you know, it is quite, quite dire. The, uh, the yeah, I'm, I'm working on a project at the moment where uh, mason bees, and I think there's literally two breeding sites left in the UK, um, or maybe it's Wales, but either way, it's very bad. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, these, these smaller species are as important. Um, and obviously the, the loss of, of uh, insects as well mm. um, and po po pollinate, po pollination services, really, really quite staggering. Um, Dave Goulson, Professor of Ecology at um, Sussex University has just brought out a book called um, Silent Earth, mm. which talks about this very problem. So there's lots of literature on, on the subject at the moment. So. Right. Um, so the next question I've got is, this one's, I think, for you, Fran. So you mentioned the benefit of having a 10 by 10 meter resolution instead of 20 by 20 meters. Doesn't the variability in biodiversity per meter squared for a particular habitat outweigh any benefits with the more accurate resolution? Uh, sorry, say that last bit a bit slowly. Got so doesn't the variability in biodiversity per meter squared uh, for a particular habitat outweigh any benefits with a more accurate yeah. resolution though? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a sound argument. I mean, um, I think it's just more, hmm, maybe the vague, vague just the, the tool purposes of the tool, if you can get more accurate um, areas in that, in theory, it should chuck out a more accurate assessment, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the so people walking on the ground, you know, as perhaps the person just made the point that in practice, one, it's not like that in nature. It doesn't just stop and start. <laughs> yeah. 
it's, it's not black and white, is it? So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, completely valid point. Yeah. Great. Um, the next question, how were the costs generated on the flow map? Uh, the value, well, there's benefits, value of the benefits of nature on the flow map. Well, just looking across a lot of literature and um, and just really drilling into different values from different data sources and coming up with a reflective range um, per habitat types. I mean, you'll be familiar with, uh, there's, lot, there's lots of recent guidance which sort of attempts to bring, bring the data sources together, like the, the enabling the natural capital approach and DEFRA. Um, and if you take carbon, for example, there's been, um, well, I think it was Cywem publication, wasn't it? Sorry, not Cywem. Um, yeah, I think so. I can't quite remember. Cywem, anyway. And also Natural England have done a, a good uh, summary of the literature. So you, you just have to, there's no one source and that's that's part of uh, Natural Capital Environmental Econ Economics role is sort of trying to stay abreast of the new data that's coming through. And as I said in my presentation, you know, making sure you're not comparing apples with pears, you're thinking through the nature of that value, is it, what data source is it, what uh, what degree of, um, so you have to look at the total economic value framework and understand is it a market value, is it more than that, um, if it's a quantity data, you know, does it reflect annual change, marginal uplift when you change from one to the other, is it a stock value, so there's quite a lot of things to think through. Um, and making sure these data sets are really robust to interrogation. So a whole, whole mix of sources is my answer in a nutshell. Great. Thanks for that. Um, there was another question, which was, do we know the leading causes of species decline in the UK? But um, uh, again, someone's kindly um, provided the State of Nature report that discusses that. So uh, that's very much appreciated. Um, I, popped, I popped in the link. Great. Yeah, that's well. perfect. Um, what you have, according to the, that report, it is um, uh, where are we? The one, the, ma the main, main, major pressures are unsustainable forms of agriculture and woodland management, climate change, urbanisation, pollution, hydrological change, and invasive non-native species. Ooh. Great, so I'll, uh, I'll move on to the next one. Um, I'm not sure if this was this one will have to be for Anna to reply later, um, but the question was due to the limitations, constraints in the data inputs to the BNG tool you mentioned, e.g. age, type, density of woodlands, would you recommend giving a range of benefits when reporting BNG at this fairly early stage, upper and lower end? Well, I'm 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 not a BNG practitioner. I, I work with colleagues who do it, but in, when I when I work with them and apply it in the projects I've worked on, I I would tend to agree with that comment. Um, it's especially it's like any assessment. You know, you do a first pass, and as things become more finalised, you revisit and you make it more detailed based on new data coming in. So. I think it's sensible to take an, a, an approach like that would be my view. Great, thanks. Um, uh, the next question was, apart from the overall limitations of any metric that uses benchmarks and averages, are there any other limitations of the metric and landscapes that the biodiversity metric is difficult to use for? That might have to be one for Anna, I think. Yeah, Anna will give a better answer than me. Great. So, um, yeah, apologies. We'll pass that one to Anna, and hopefully she'll be able to uh, to provide a response. Then we had uh, another question. Do you have any comparable BNG tools experience from other countries? Uh, are other countries implementing legally binding BNG targets too? So I think that's a good question. Mm. Um, I've, not, uh, I, I've not had any experience heard anything about other countries uh, that's probably because i'm quite inexperienced in this but i'm um, maybe i put it through to anyone in the chat group if if you could let us know if there's been any 
uh, such tools or experience used in, in other countries? I think there must be, for sure. And the people, yeah. People at DEFRA would have looked at that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there was one one question. Oh, there's a few more. Sorry, I've missed. Um, to, to do what is the best way for charities to get involved with the delivery of net gain solutions, e.g., local river trusts? Well, I think that's that's the question. It's not just net gain. It's just getting involved in nature recovery projects, isn't it? And I don't think that mechanism or that way is, would have changed so much yeah i think they've got still got a bit to flesh out as well don't they with um you know the development of all of this as well because there will have to be some form of enforcement going forward and um you know there'll be some form of covenants as well so i think mm. i think going forward um there will be probably responsible bodies are will have to get involved with um uh you know ensuring the implementation and and, and that's perhaps something that they might get, you know, local river trusts, et cetera, involved in. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I think there's a lot of development still to happen in that. I'll probably emerge on a local by local basis. Um, yeah. I don't think there's going to be any, I get the impression there's not going to be sort of any set way in rolling it out. <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah. going to lead to interesting consequences, but hopefully lots of innovation as well. So. Yeah. Um, do you think the values gained in improvements in certain habitats, um, e.g. woodlands and hedgerows, is inflated compared to habitats such as wetlands? Uh, what do you mean inflated? Lar you, th you think it's a bit larger than you would expect it to be because of its because it's a woodland and a wetland? Uh, it seems like, yeah, I think that's, that's probably inflation. the angle that question's pointing at, yeah um the value so you mean the monetary values we can attach to them mm. yeah i think potentially i think it's just a case of going back to the data sources and i'd say far more attention it's probably a consequence of more attention to date has been given to woodlands and wetlands than hedgerows per se but i think that's I think that's going to be an interesting outcome of all of this work is that our attention and emphasis and more resource is going to be uh, rather than trying to understand the benefits of, benefits of particular habitats, it's more important now that we try and equalise that and look at all of them fairly across the board. So I think um, more, more detail, we, we need to ensure that we're applying the process in a fair way across different habitats if we want mm. outcomes. So yeah. say there is probably a risk of them being inflated. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, to, to do what else is that? There? There's quite a few questions. There's a comment by Robin Walsing. Uh, my answer to the second question would be that the consultants uh, had better employ ecologists. Um, the general answer to the third question is that uh, nearly all are, um, and the most acu uh, acutely endangered are in the red data lists. Uh, and from the chat, I would urge th uh, thinking about the plants as much as the animals. Yeah, I think, yeah. but yeah, I think all they're all good points, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, there's a there's a there's the 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 field is heavily recruiting and trying their best to recruit, and I think this uh, this is one of the fields where there's you know a lot of demand compared to supply at the moment, so it's uh, it's, it's something promising if you're considering going into it. Yeah, we're certainly struggling to fill posts. So yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, I'm just conscious economists out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm conscious it's just after 6.30 now and we've still got quite a few questions. So, um, Barbara, I'm just wondering, is it, should I, should I leave it there and then we can provide answers to the remainder um, through, uh, through email? Yes, we can, we can, we could do that. Um, I've got, I'll be able to produce a report of the few of the questions and answers yeah and then um who's asked them so if unless it's anonymous then <laughs> we don't know who's asked it yeah but you can certainly you can certainly um get the information back yeah people 
It's been a very interesting, interesting talk, and um, I really would like to thank uh, thank you all for attending, and also for the Northwestern branch and um, for, for organising it, and to our two speakers, Fran and um, Anna, um, for a really interesting um, whiz through the biodiversity net gain. And there's lots of lots to think about there. It's quite a new approach that there that, that's being applied, especially with the with the new system that's being brought out by Natural England. So um, we just see how to have to see how it plays out. And you see, the longer we, the more we more cases that, that, that are actually reviewed, um, the better better we'll see yeah. what works. And I agree that you know basically local authorities can only do their job properly if they employ the experts to be able to deliver that, those, those, those reports and, and to implement policy properly. So um, I would encourage local authorities to employ more ecologists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and um, yeah, for myself as well, thanks to Fran and Anna for the, um, you know, to providing the expert uh, advice. But I was also thinking, Barbara, that it could be, you know, because it's such a developing field, it's something that definitely that I feel in the Northwest and North Wales branch that we could um, we could have follow up um, events. Just, you know, if there's any case studies in the Northwest, then we'll try to get hold of them and, and share, um, uh, you know, share such uh, outcomes from these uh, studies, um, just so that, you know, it's I think it's good for everyone to to learn slowly about how this can be applied? Well, certainly I know that we've had um, various um, international events on uh, biodiversity net gain. And I think looking at um, the climate and the ecological emergency and COP26 and COP15 that are coming up, um, again, SIWEM will be following up on, on that. So if you do have any, any more topics on, on, the, on biodiversity, in general, or the ecological or climate emergency, then we're more than delighted to, to help you support, support you in hosting that. Um, and of course, if, and if there's anybody out there who would like to be a speaker and so on, I'm sure if you get in touch with the Northwest branch, they'll be more than happy to, um, to um, engage with you. Definitely. So I think we'll, we'll call it a day, um, but thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, do have a look at our events page um, to, to see what the events are coming up. Um, also, we, um, I'm not sure whether this, is going, this recording is going to be on, on the website, but I will, once I've got confirmation of that, it will be put up and it can be viewed with all our other past webinars. Um, let me just put the link in the chat for you. Um, all the past silent webinars um, videos can be found on the website at that link. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night. Thank keep, you. Keep, keep safe and well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.